Yesterday we discussed the pitfalls of commercial banking and today we are going to discuss another type of bank, the central bank, a relatively new invention. But was it a good idea? My name is Sam Vaknin and I'm a professor of finance. Central banking, as I said, is a relatively new invention. And there was even a, an American president, Andrew Jackson, and he dispensed. He dispensed with this country's central bank in the 19th century because he did not think that it was very important. He may have been onto something. <laughs> Things, though, have changed a lot since. Central banks today are the most important feature of the financial systems of the majority of countries. The problem is this. Central banks are very bizarre hybrids. Some of the functions of central banks are identical to those of regular commercial banks. Other tasks are unique to the central bank. And on certain functions, the central bank has an absolute legal monopoly. It is criminal. It's a criminal offense to try to emulate these functions. Exactly like commercial banks, central banks take deposits. But they take deposits from other banks, from commercial banks. In some cases, central banks take deposits from foreign governments. These foreign governments deposit their foreign exchange and gold reserves for safekeeping. The Federal Reserve Bank of the United States is famous for this. The central bank invests also the foreign exchange reserve of its own country. It tries to maintain an investment portfolio similar to the trade composition of its main client, the state. The central bank also holds on to the gold reserves of the country. Most central banks have, until recently, tried to get rid of their gold due to the ever-declining prices. <laughs> but then gold shot up. Since the gold is registered in their books in historical values, central banks have shown a handsome profit on this sideline of essentially trading activities. But they have been too hasty. Gold has tripled in value since. Central banks, especially the US Fed, also participate in the important, um, in the important role of international negotiations. Uh, they usually don't do so directly, but even when they are not present around the table, they exert influence behind the scenes. The German Bundes Bundesbank, for example, virtually dictated Germany's position in the give and take leading to the Maastricht Treaty. It forced the hands of its co-signatories to agree to strict terms of accession into the Euro single currency project. The Bundesbank, an inflation hawk, demanded that a country's economy be totally stable, that a country's economy be possessed of low debt ratios and low inflation before it is accepted into the Eurozone. It is an irony of history that Germany itself is no longer eligible, actually, under these very criteria and would not have been accepted as a member in the very club whose rules it had assisted to formulate. But irony is a byline of history. All these, all these functions that I mentioned constitute a secondary and marginal plank of a central bank activities. The main function of a modern central bank is the monitoring and regulation of interest rates in the economy. The central bank does this by changing the interest rates that it charges on money that it lends to the banking system through its discount windows. Interest rates are supposed to influence the level of economic activity in the economy. This purported linkage has not been, I repeat, has not been unequivocally substantiated by economic research actually. The transmission mechanisms are not very clear. Also, there usually is a delay between the alteration of interest rates and the foreseen impact on the economy. As I said, transmission me mechanisms have to be set into gear. They take time. <laughs>
this makes an assessment of interest rate policies very difficult. Still, central banks use interest rates to fine-tune the economy. Higher interest rates lead, normally, to lower activity and lower inflation. The reverse is also supposed to be true. Even shifts of a quarter of a percentage point are sufficient to send stock exchanges tumbling together with bond markets. In 1994, a long-term trend of increase in interest rates commenced in the United States, doubling them from 3 to 6%. Investors in the bond markets lost 1 trillion, 1,000 billion US dollars within 12 months. Even today, currency traders all around the world dread the decisions of the Federal Reserve, the Fed, or the European Central Bank, the ECB. They sit with their eyes glued to their trading screens on days in which announcements are expected. Talk about existential dread and anxiety disorder. <laughs> My other hat as a former visiting professor of psychology. Tinkering with interest rates is only the latest in a series of fads of micro macroeconomic management. Prior to this, may I remind you, under the influence of the Chicago School of Economics, central banks used to monitor and manipulate money supply aggregates. Simply put, central banks would sell bonds to the public and absorb liquidity, or buy bonds from the public and inject liquidity. Additionally, central banks would restrict the amount of printed money and limit the government's ability to borrow. So this was another craze, money supply. Prior to the money supply craze, and for decades, there was a widespread belief in the effectiveness of manipulating exchange rates, actually. So you see, there are fashions, <laughs> in and out of fashion. So the fashion then was exchange rates. This was especially true where exchange controls were still being implemented and currencies were not fully convertible. Britain removed it as its exchange controls only as late as 1979, believe it or not. The US dollar was pegged to a gold standard and thus not really fully convertible well into 1971. God bless Nixon. Free flows of currencies are relatively a relatively new thing and their long absence reflects this deeply and widely held superstition of central banks. Nowadays, exchange rates are considered to be a soft monetary instrument and are rarely used by central banks. Central banks continue, though, to intervene in the trading of currencies in the international and domestic markets, usually to no avail and while losing their credibility in the process. It's a throwback, a hangover. <laughs> Ever since the ignominious failure in implementing the infamous Louvre Accord in 1985, Currency intervention is considered to be somewhat, a somewhat rusty relic of the old ways of thinking. Okay, so central banks are prone to fads and fashions, like every influencer on Instagram. <laughs> central banks are heavily enmeshed in the very fabric of the commercial banking system. They perform certain indispensable services for commercial banks. In most countries, interbank payments pass through the central bank or through a clearing organ which is somehow linked to or reports to the central bank. All major foreign exchange transactions are funneled through and in many countries still must be approved by the central bank. Central banks regulate banks, license the owners of banks, supervise the operations of banks and keenly monitor the liquidity of banks. The central bank is the lender of last resort in cases of banking insolvency or illiquidity, also known as a run on the banks. The frequent claims of central banks all over the world that they were surprised by this or that banking crisis look therefore dubious at best. No central bank can say with a straight face that it was, has been unaware of early warning flags or that it possessed no access to all the data. Impending banking crises give out signals long before they erupt. These precur precursors ought to be detected by a reasonably managed central bank. Only major neglect could explain why a central bank is caught unprepared. One sure sign is the number of times that a certain commercial bank 
chooses to borrow from the central bank's discount windows. Another sign is if the commercial bank offers interest rates which are way above the rates preferred by other financing institutions. There are many more toxins with a C, signs, alarm bells, and central banks should be adept at reading the tea leaves. And this heavy involvement of central banks in the banking system is not limited to the collection and analysis of data. A central bank, by the very definition of its functions, sets the tone to all other banks in the economy. By altering its policies, for example, by changing its reserve requirements, a central bank can push commercial banks into ins insolvency, or it can create asset bubbles which are bound to burst and adversely affect the total economy. If it were not for the easy and cheap money provided by the Bank of Japan in the 80s, the stock and real estate markets would not have inflated to the extent that they have. Subsequently, it was the same bank, under a different governor of course, that tightened the reins of credit and pierced both bubble markets. The same mistake was repeated in 1992 and 93 in Israel, and with the same consequences. The pattern recurred in the, in the United States with the Fed during the 1990s and early 2000s, hence the Great Recession 2008, 2009, 2007 even. It seems that central banks don't learn the appropriate lessons. This is precisely why central banks, in my view, should not supervise the banking system. When asked to supervise the banking system, central banks are really expected to criticize their own performance, including past performance, their own policies, and their own vigilance or lack thereof. In most countries in the world, bank supervision is a heavyweight department within the central bank. It samples the balance sheets and practices of banks pe periodically. It analyzes the books thoroughly and imposes rules of conduct and sanctions when necessary. And yet, the role of central banks in determining the health, the behavior, methods, and the methods of operation of commercial banks. This role is so paramount that it is highly undesirable for a central bank to supervise itself, in effect. Because the central bank determines the operations, profit margins, everything in commercial banking. So when the central bank is, supposed, is asked to supervise commercial banking, it is actually asked to supervise itself. To reiterate, bank supervision carried out by a central bank means that the central bank has to criticize itself, its own policies, and the way that they had been enforced, as well as objectively review the results of its own past supervision. That's asking the impossible. Central banks are thus asked to cast themselves in the unbelievable role of self-sacrificial and impartial saints. And even governors of central banks are not saints ask the Pope. A new trend is to put the supervision of banks under a different sponsor and to construct a system of checks and balances wherein the central bank, its policies and operations are indirectly criticized and reviewed by the supervision of banks. This is the case in Switzerland, where the banking system is extremely well regulated and well supervised. Credit Suisse, notwithstanding. <laughs> there are two types of central bank, the autonomous and the semi-autonomous. The autonomous central bank is politically and financially independent. Its governor is appointed for a period of time which is incommensurate with the terms in office of incumbent elected officials, so that the governor is not subject to political pressures. The governor outlasts politicians. The autonomous central bank's budget is not provided by the legislature or by the executive arm. It is self-sustaining. The central bank runs itself as a corporation would. Its profits are used in linear years in which it loses money. Prime examples of autonomous central banks are Germany's Bundesbank and the American Federal Reserve Bank, which is actually a system of regional banks. The second type, the second type of a central bank is a semi-autonomous bank. This is a central bank that depends on political parties and especially on the Ministry of Finance. Its budget is allocated by, to it by the Ministry or, by, or by, by, by Parliament. The upper echelons of such a bank, the semi-autonomous bank, 
the governor, the vice governor, can be impeached by politicians. And this is the case with the National People's Bank of Macedonia, for example, which has to report to parliament. Such dependent banks fulfill the function of an economic advisor to the government. The governor of the Bank of England advises the chancellor of the exchequer in their famous weekly meetings, the minutes of which are published. And he provides advice about the desirable level of interest rates, mostly. The situation is somewhat better with the Bank of Israel, which can play around with interest rates and foreign exchange rates, but is still not entirely free. As you see, there are many models uh, of central banks around. But what's common to all of them is that central banks are asked to do the impossible, to control inflation while maintaining high employment, to supervise commercial banks while criticizing their own supervision, etc., etc. It's time to disentangle this Gordic knot. Otherwise, we are bound to have a major global financial crisis every two years and nine months. Yes, this is the statistic for the 20th century.